kids are going to head out to Ogden Kids Worship. Everybody else, go ahead and turn towards Amos chapter 4. We are approaching the halfway point in our study of the book of Amos. And so uh, go ahead and turn there with me this morning as we continue our time together in the Word. What we've seen over the last several weeks is that our God is a God of justice. That He is a God that will not simply forever, even though He is gracious and patient, He is a God who will not forever turn a blind eye to the afflictions of the innocent. That He is a God who will call to account those who take advantage of others and hurt others, who use others as a stepping stone for their own uh, advancement. And that's exactly what we've been seeing. We We saw in the early chapters of this book that God had gone through and pronounced judgment on all these different nations, but the whole point, the whole goal of this proclamation is to ultimately draw attention to Israel, that Israel, the very ones who God had rescued from the land of Egypt, the very ones that God had seen through the wilderness, the very ones that God had procured a land for their own possession, the very people that God had called to be separate and to be an example to the nations of the love of of God, these people had begun to hurt others and use others and take advantage, especially of the poor and the needy and those that were being afflicted. And he's drawing a connection. He's, he's starting the kind of the question that's undergirding this whole thing is what could have led Israel to this point? What could have led Israel, who was called, who was given the law of God, who was told right from wrong, what could have led them to this point where they're just completely forsaking the things of God and hurting others? And the connection is it has to do with their worship. And there's this connection between right worship and justice. That if we're failing to worship God correctly, if our hearts are hardened towards the things of God, then we're not going to have a right relationship with God. And this inevitably is going to affect our relationship with our fellow man. That when we have a right relationship with God and we're seeking to honor God and please God, then we're going to see our fellow man as people created in the image of God, and we're going to treat them as such. But when we get that out of alignment, when we fail to see God as who he truly is, then all of a sudden we become capable of treating people in some of the most atrocious ways. This is what had happened in Israel. When the kingdoms had divided, they had basically set up their own religious system. They no longer were traveling to Jerusalem to worship at the temple, to worship Yahweh as they had been told to. But instead, their kings had set up their own system of worship there in Dan and Bethel so that they could go to this place and there were these golden calves and they could worship because it was convenient. They didn't have to go all the way down to Jerusalem. But this lifestyle that was out of alignment with God, that was not living in surrender to God and being obedient to Him, was inevitably beginning to affect not only their relationship with their Creator, but ultimately how they treated each other. And we're going to see that uh, lived out in, in several different ways this morning. Look at Amos chapter 4. Let's read this together as we begin our time today. It says, Hear this word, you cows of Bashan, who are on the mountain of Samaria, who oppress the poor, who crush the needy, who say to your husbands, Bring that we may drink. The Lord God has sworn by his holiness that behold, the days are coming upon you. When they shall take you away with hooks, even the last of you with fish hooks. And you shall go out through the breaches, each one straight ahead. And you shall be cast out into Harmon, declares the Lord. 
Come to Bethel and transgress, to Gilgal and multiply transgressions. Bring your sacrifices every morning, your tithes every three days. Offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving of that which is leavened, and proclaim freewill offerings. Publish them, for so you love to do, O people of Israel, declares the Lord God. I gave you cleanness of teeth in all your cities and lack of bread in all your places, yet you did not return to me, declares the Lord. I also withheld the rain from you when there was yet three months of the harvest, and I would send rain on one city and send no rain on another city. And one field would have rain, and the field on which it did not rain would wither. So two or three cities would wander to another city to drink water and would not be satisfied. Yet you did not return to me, declares the Lord. I struck you with blight and mildew, your many gardens and your vineyards, your fig trees and your olive trees, the locust devoured, yet you did not return to me, declares the Lord. I sent among you a pestilence after the manner of Egypt, and I killed your young men with the sword, and I carried away your horses, and I made the stench of your camp go up into your nostrils, yet you did not return to me, declares the Lord. I overthrew some of you as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, and you were as, brand, as a brand plucked out of the burning, yet you did not return to me, declares the Lord. Therefore, thus I will do to you, O Israel, because I will do this to you. Prepare to meet your God, O Israel. For behold, he who forms the mountains and creates the wind and declares to man what is his thought, who makes the morning darkness and treads on the heights of the earth, the Lord, the God of hosts, is his name. Let's pray. <coughs> Father God, we recognize who you are, that you are the giver and sustainer of life, that we need you. <coughs> and so Lord, now as we come to a very demanding text, I pray that you would give us understanding. I pray that you would open our eyes to see and our ears to hear and our hearts to receive the truth of your word. Lord, apart from you speaking into our hearts, Lord, maybe there's some here today that need to be saved. They are staring into the face of judgment. Lord, today what they need more than anything is to know you. But Lord, for so many others here today, they have a relationship with you. They're already believers, and yet they never come to your word idly. They never come to your word flippantly. We always come seeking transformation, seeking you to move and to work and to shape and to change our hearts and to help us be more like you. So God, I pray during this time, God, that you might open our eyes, that we might see and behold wonderful things out of your law. Help us to follow after you. In all these things we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. This morning we're going to highlight three problems in Israel's worship. And we're connecting this idea of worship, right worship and justice and wrong worship and what leads to injustice. And so we're going to highlight this morning ultimately three problems that Israel was experiencing in their worship and why it was, how it was actually causing them to lead lives that were characterized by injustice and cruelty towards their fellow man. The first thing we're going to see is that for Israel, their social status had become their savior. Their social status had become their savior. See, part of the problem that Amos saw was that for the rich and the powerful, they were more concerned with their elevated style of living, their social status, than they were with how they treated people. And he's going to highlight this, this attitude specifically by pointing out the behavior of certain aristocratic noble women there in Israel. Look what he says to begin with. There in verse 1, he says, Hear this word, you cows of Bashan, who are on the mountain of Samaria, who oppress the poor, who crush the needy, who say to your husbands, Bring that we may drink. Now, I want to... Stop there for a moment, because at first glance, 
uh, especially reading this from our Western perspective, this seems pretty shocking. Uh, did he just call this group of women a bunch of cows? Well, yes, he did. And I, I believe the answer to that question is yes and no, because there is a certain level of difference in the language, and there's a variation between Western and Eastern figurative language. Like, like Eastern cultures use figurative language just very differently than we do. Uh, think about like the Song of Songs. Have you ever read through the book of Song of Songs? There's extremely figurative language in the Song of Songs. Uh, like I've never looked at Amanda and told Amanda that her hair looks like a flock of goats. You know, I've never looked at her and said your teeth look like freshly shorn ewe lambs all standing in a row. I've never told her her cheeks are like pomegranates or her eyes are like doves. So we need to understand some perspective here. When he calls them cows of Bashan, there's, there's some loaded terminology there. Because the region of Bashan there in Israel was famous for their livestock, for their cows. Think about today how uh, there, there's like Kobe beef. And Kobe beef is raised in a particular region of Japan. It's, one of, it's famous for its quality and its delicacy. It's a delicacy. So much so that just uh, that it goes on the market, we're talking like somewhere between two hundred and five hundred dollars a pound. That's an expensive steak, and so it's a very well-known, very uh, delicate, very uh, delicacy, if you will. And the region of Bashan, there in northeast Israel, was known for their fertile plains, which made it a, a, an excellent place for raising some of the finest cattle in all of Israel. This would have been especially true for those cattle who had the privilege of grazing on the mountains of Samaria. So there's this understanding that, that, that he's pointing to this, this opulence, to this delicacy, to this, this elevated status in what he's calling them. But at the end of the day, it's still not an extremely flattering picture to be called a bunch of well-fed cattle. Amos is going to highlight three things about these women and their love of their social status that were dangerous and that they needed to be careful of. The first thing he's going to say is that they were powerful, that they had been given a great amount of power, and this power was being used in ungodly ways. Specifically, he says there that they are those who oppress the poor. So I don't mean this idea that they're powerful in a good way. See, when we think, when I think about the word power, the word influence comes to mind. Somebody who has great power is somebody who has great influence. Powerful people have the ability to influence and make a difference in the lives of those around them, either for good or for bad. These women, because of their wealth and because of their influence, they had the opportunity to be a blessing to the poor and the needy around them. They had a the opportunity to influence greatly society and the way others are treated. To be a hand that lifted others up instead of a hand that, that's used to push others down. But instead, that's exactly what they were doing. It made them feel better about themselves, more powerful in their own right, when they could look down at others and push them down so that they might be built up. And these women were powerful, but not in a good way. We also see that these women were pompous. They were pompous. It says there that they are not only oppressing the poor, but they are the ones who crush the needy. So they saw themselves as better than others, and because of that, they felt that they gave them the right to look down in their noses and to speak down to those who weren't up to their level of social prowess. See, especially if someone was different than they were, or they didn't run in the same social circles as they were, then they looked down and they felt that those people were inferior to them. So they were powerful, they oppressed the poor, they were pompous, they, they crushed the needy. But we also see that they were pampered. 
It says that these are women who say to their husbands, bring that we may drink. Ultimately, it's a picture of a life that is characterized by indulgence and opulence. It's a life organized on the basis of me first, that everything is about my comfort, that my comfort is more important than your comfort, that my security is more important than your security, that my happiness is more important than your happiness, that my success is more important than your success. It's this idea that in my possessions and in my social standing and in my wealth, I have everything that I need. And listen to me, church, this is a dangerous place to be because the tendency is to think I have everything that I have, I have everything that I need. Why do I need Jesus? So we must be careful. We must be careful when we find ourselves, because we in the United States of America have been blessed. We have more than 90% of the rest of the world. God has poured out blessing upon us to the point that we could be considered rich and wealthy and to some extent powerful and pampered. And yet we must not look at ourselves and think that we have everything that we need, because ultimately we always need. God says here, I will not stand for this type of behavior. Look at verses 2 and 3. He says, The Lord God has sworn by his holiness that, behold, the days are coming upon you when they shall take, away, take you away with hooks, even the last of you with fish hooks. And you shall go out through the breaches, each one straight ahead, and you shall be cast out into, the, into Harmon, declares the Lord. Like God says, you think your elevated social status is going to save you? And the fact that you have the nicest clothes and the biggest houses, the fact that you have fancy jewelry, you think that's going to save you in that final day? It's like he's saying, well, I have some jewelry for you. One day soon, I'm going to drag you away with a hook through the wall. While he's talking specifically to the women here, this particular group of women, all of Israel is guilty of this. They've stepped so far from God that they don't even acknowledge their need for him anymore. In church, that is a dangerous place. So we see here that their social status, that their elevated view of themselves had become their savior. It's where they were finding their peace and their comfort and their deliverance and their salvation. And God is saying that in that day of trouble, in that final judgment, that will not stand. Second thing we're going to see about the people of Israel in this day is that their worship had become a game. Their worship had become a game. Notice here in verse 4, Amos, Amos is going to start turning the sarcasm level up to about 10. So if, if you didn't catch on to that, that may be why it was Trump. You had trouble maybe understanding what he's doing there. Because he's, he's getting extremely sarcastic in what he's saying here. Verse 4, he says, come to Bethel and transgress. Remember, Bethel is one of the places they were coming for worship. So it's like, come to church. You're just going to sin when you're there anyway. So come to Bethel and transgress, to Gilgal and multiply transgressions. Bring your sacrifices every morning and your tithes every three days. Offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving of that which is leavened and proclaim free will offerings. Publish them. Let it all be known. For so you love to do. You see, here we have a whole people, a whole people who are going through the motions of spiritual devotion. But for them, it's all just one big game. It's all for show. You can almost hear their joking. Well, i got to go to church this week. we got a lot of things to make up for. Boy, did I have a good night last night. I better go ask for forgiveness. It's all a game to them. It's 
See, there is religious activity, but it is void of spiritual authenticity. They're, they're, they're coming to church. They're giving their sacrifices. They're singing the songs. They're saying the prayers. They're going through the motions of spiritual activity. But there is nothing authentic about it. There is no heart change. There is no true repentance. There is no seeking the face of God. There is no conformity to his standard, to his will. There is no obedience. It's just show. We're going to see this idea demonstrated in multiple ways. One, we're going to see that they're more concerned with religious innovation than biblical obedience. They're more concerned with religious innovation than biblical obedience. It says there that they were offering, that, that offer or burn a sacrifice of thanksgiving of that which is leaven. This was expressly forbidden in Leviticus 2 verse 11. So they're not doing what God had told them to do. They're kind of creating their own style, their own way, their own uh, method of worship that suits them better. That's different. And they're like, you know what? What's the big deal? It's not like God expects us to obey all the time. Yes, he does. And this is the world that we live in today. It becomes where if you stand on what the word of God says, and this is what they were experiencing. It's where if you stand on what the word of God says, they would laugh you out of the building. What do you mean God expects us to live a certain way? What do you mean God expects us to deny our urges? What do you mean God expects us to keep his law and to be obedient to him? It's this old idea of we don't have to do it that way. And yet God has told us to be obedient to him. We're also going to see that their religious experience had become all about personal appearance. So their religious experience had become all about personal appearance. That it was all about what are people seeing me do. He talks there about proclaiming your free will offerings, about publishing them so that everybody knows what you've given, everybody knows what you've done. He says, for you for so you love to do, O people of God. Israel. <clears throat> this idea of instead of giving and giving obediently, and even at one point the Bible talks about giving secretly. Not, you're not proclaiming to everybody, look what I've given, but you're giving in such a way that even your right hand and left hand don't know what each other is doing. That's what Jesus talked about. But for them, it had become all about look how much this person gave. Look at how they would proclaim. So that everybody can see. So I want you to notice something here. And I don't want us to miss this. It wasn't that the people had stopped going to church. It's quite the opposite. Business was booming. The church was booming. The altars were full at Bethel and Gilgal. The, 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 the budgets were Oh, exploding because they were giving abundantly. The, the altars were being used. They were filled with people and their sacrifices. But the problem wasn't that the people had stopped going to church. It was that going to church had lost all of its impact in the lives of the people. They were not allowing themselves to be conformed to the will of God. There's a song that our kids sometimes play. I'm not going to sing it because it's Christian rap, so that would not go over well if you heard me try to do it. But there's a song called Church Clap that our kids all are always playing in the background. And there's some lines there that every time I hear it, stand out to me. They jump out to me. It says, there's nothing wrong with singing loud, but that's not where the power is found. For too long, the church has been clapping at weak sermons, leaving the weak hurt 
No one's changed by Sunday service. We need discernment and to check what we've been affirming because the church can be full of members but empty in conversion. Church, we need the power of God to fill this place. Listen, we can show up. This is one of my great fears. We can show up here every single week and we can sing the songs every single week and we can listen to the sermon and pray the prayers every week single week, and nothing in our lives change if we're not depending on the will of God and the power of God to show up and transform us. If we're not seeking Him, we can go through the motions but be pointless. We must surrender to Him. We must seek His faith. Israel, their worship had become a game. They were just going through the motions. There was nothing spiritually authentic about it. And then the last thing I want us to see this morning is that their view of God had no room for revelation or repentance. Their view of God had no room for revelation or repentance. See, inevitably what happens when you start going through the motions of worship without really seeking after God, what starts happening is that your view of God begins to shrink. You stop wrestling with the complexity and the beauty and the majesty of who God is, and you start trying to fit God within this little box so that he's easy to understand, he's easy to control. A God that only affirms you and only loves what you love. A God who would never convict you of your sins or your pride. A God who instead of being made in his image, he is made in our image. And inevitably will say things like, well, my God is not like this. Start fashioning a God who would never ask us to give too much or sacrifice too much, or go too far, or change too much. A God, or, or God forbid, ask us to give up our life in obedience and surrender and submission to Him. We live in a world today that is, that is substituted. Take up your cross for live your best life now. See, when we get to this point, we have stopped listening. And this is what Israel was doing. Their view of God had so diminished that they were practically saying, God, we, we will call on you if we need you, but if we don't need you, otherwise just stand in the corner and don't mess anything up. Everything's going well. But listen, because they weren't listening, because they were doing their own thing, they were missing what God was saying, and God was warning them, Time and time and time again, he has had them called to return to him, to turn their lives around, to believe and to trust in what only he can do. And so he says there in verse 6, I gave you cleanness of teeth in all your cities and lack of bread in all your places. <coughs> and the idea there is that as you long for bread that would feed your physical body, God is saying, I had hoped that you would see your need for the bread of life that sustains your very soul. Yet, you did not return to me, declares the Lord. And then he says, I also withheld the rain from you there, when you there uh, were yet three months of the harvest. And I would send rain on one city and send no rain on another city. And one field would have rain and the field on which it did not rain would wither. So two or three cities would wander to another city to drink water and would not be satisfied. And as your tongue swelled and your thirst grew, I had hoped that you would see your need for the living water, the water that will ultimately satisfy you completely, yet you did not return to me, declares the Lord. <coughs> he says, I struck you with blight and with mildew, your many gardens and your vineyards, your fig trees and your olive trees, the locusts devoured. And as your vineyards decayed and your vines rotted, I had hoped that you would look to the true vine and that you would abide in it so that you might never cease to bear spiritual fruit. 
yet you did not return to me, declares the Lord. He says, I sent among you a pestilence after the manner of Egypt, and I killed your young men with the sword and carried away your horses, and I made the stench of your camp go up into your nostrils. And as you buried your dead and experienced the horrors of war and death and to the point the smell of it was so thick that it flooded your nostrils, I had hoped that it would cause you to cry out to me who is the resurrection and the life and the only one who can truly deliver you out of this trouble. And yet it says, you did not return to me. So he says in verse 11, I overthrew some of you, as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, and you were as a brand plucked up out of the burning, yet you did not return to me, declares the Lord. Warning, warning, warning. There are times and there are seasons, this isn't hard for us to hear for some of us. There are times in which God will intentionally bring trials and struggles and hardship into our life so that we might understand that we cannot do this on our own. So that we might understand our dependence and turn and run to Him. But as long as we keep trying to fight that battle in our own strength, as long as we keep trying to depend on things like our wealth and our position and our politics and our ourselves, we will never fully experience the grace and renewal and power that only comes from He's telling Israel over and over and over again, I've tried to get your attention and you keep running from me. And so he says, there's going to come a time and a day when you simply run out of time for running. He tells them there, therefore, verse 12, thus I will do to you, O Israel, because I will do this to you. Prepare This is the reality. What you do with Jesus, that can either be a joyful statement or it can be a horrifying statement. If you know Jesus Christ and your blood, his blood has covered your sins and so he has paid the full price for you so that you can be redeemed and have a new life, then that reality of one day standing before God is not a, a horrifying reality, it's a joyful reality. But for the vast majority of the world that have continued to run from God, that have continued to turn their backs on Him, that have done life their own way instead of living in obedience to Him, for them, that reality that every single person will one day stand before God. Hebrews tells us that it is destined for every man who wants to die, and after that comes judgment. Everyone will stand before a holy and righteous God one day. You better be. Some that believe that, oh, well, when I get there, I'll just, I, I, I'll just stand before God and I'll just tell Him how it is. No, you don't. No, you don't. What a horrifying reality to think that you could ever stand before God in all of your wickedness and all of your sin, and you could make a case for yourself. He is a God that is, He says here, that the, He forms the mountains and creates the wind. He declares to man what His thoughts are. Not just your actions, what your very thoughts are. Who makes morning darkness and treads on the heights of the earth. You know, we're not going to stand before God and we'll be proclaiming anything. We're going to fall on our faces and we're going to say, greater are you, Lord. So I want to challenge you this day. Instead, run to him. Seek his face. 
not found in our spiritual activity. It's not found in what we give, what we do. 